The other flip-flop that we use most often is called a JK flip-flop. And again, I'm not gonna build the derivation for you, but the intent, as you will see, is that you wanna replicate some of the features of the RS latch uh, without that race condition. And so the way we do this is that instead of having a race condition, we have a special condition called invert. And so what happens is, if both J and K inputs are zero, we're gonna hold the value. This is just like an RS latch. If J is zero and K is one, we're gonna reset. Again, this is just like the RS latch. If J is one and K is zero, <clears throat> we're going to set, just like the RS latch. And if J is one and K is one, then the next state, the next stable stored state, will be the opposite of whatever is currently being stored. So we're gonna invert, but in a much more stable and consistent way than the race condition would allow us to do. And so this is what we call a JK flip-flop, and you're gonna use this a lot. I'll keep referring back to this again, uh, but it's one way to remember which one does which, to me anyway, is that the um, J um, value is sort of like uh, the S, because it's sort of curvy like an S, and the K value is sort of like the R. It sort of looks the same. The, uh, the J value sort of is curvy like an S, and the K kind of looks like an R. So if you ever forget, which one of J and K are meant to emulate S and R. Uh, that's how I remember it anyway. So the J is sort of like the S, the K is sort of like the R, and the inversion is a, a, a different kind of race condition that is stable, predictable, and makes sense. <clears throat> so if this is the characteristic table for our JK flip-flop, our excitation table, which again is what inputs you want to use to drive the machine to do what you want it to do, looks like this and there's don't cares everywhere. It's kind of cool. So if I'm in state zero and I want to move to state zero, then there's two ways to do it. Either I can hold my value or reset. J is one, K doesn't matter, right? Both of these options give you that transition. If I'm in state zero and I want to go to state one, again, I have two options. I can either set, or I can invert, and so J is one and K doesn't matter. Both of these options will give you that in that uh, state change. If I'm in state one and I wanna to go to state zero, again, two options, I can either reset or invert. And then if I'm in state one and I want the next state to also be one, two options again, I can hold or I can set, and that, means that K has to be zero, but J doesn't matter. So there are four possibilities um, with the excitation table. If I'm in state Q and I wanna to go to state Q, these are the inputs you have to provide to this new kind of flip-flop to make those transition happen. And you'll see as we actually do the sequential design process, these don't cares are gonna be very useful, but there's gonna be a toss up. There's gonna to be sort of a choice to make. If I do not tell you which kind of flip-flop to use, then you can either use a D or a JK. There's other kinds, there's T flip-flops and there's other stuff like that that we won't worry too much about. D and JK are enough for our purposes. If you have a choice, then um, a D flip-flop requires half as many design elements because you only have to design the inputs to the D value for that uh, storage element. If you're designing a circuit to drive a JK flip-flop, you need one circuit for J and another for K. So there's twice as much design work, but the design work is super easy because every input is gonna be full of don't care conditions. And so the, the, the end results are much simpler, uh, but you have to do them twice. <laughs> so as we give some examples of these sequential designs, you'll see how that kind of decision-making can be done.